Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. The Life of George Washington, with curious anecdotes equally honorable to himself and exemplary to his young countrymen, by Mason Locke Weems. Chapter 1. Who, then, that has a spark of virtuous curiosity, but must wish to know the history of Washington? But is not his history already known? Have not a thousand orators spread Washington's fame abroad, bright as his own Potomac, which he reflects the morning sun and flames like a sea of liquid gold, the wonder and delight of all the neighboring shores? Yes, they have indeed spread his fame abroad. His fame as Generalissimo of the armies and first president of the councils of his nation. But this is not half his fame. True, he has been seen in greatness, but it is only the greatness of public character, which is no evidence of true greatness, for a public character is often an artificial one. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 209 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you Learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Biography Since the earliest days of the United States, and even before 13 colonies came together to forge a nation, Americans have been interested in biography. But why? What is it about the lives of others that makes the past so interesting and fun to explore? This episode marks the start of a new four-episode Doing History series it will take us behind the scenes of biography and how historians and biographers reconstruct the lives of people from the past. Now, in our modern 21st century, biography stands as one of the top-selling categories of all books in the United States. Of course, this isn't really a new trend, because biographies have always been popular with Americans. On May 15, 1830, the New York Mirror and Ladies Literary Gazette used the phrase biographical mania to explain, quote, the eagerness with which every species of biography is read in the present-day United States, end quote. So even in the early part of the 19th century, Americans were captivated by the genre. Now, the historic American interest in biography seems like a really good place for us to begin our behind-the-scenes exploration. As we know, everything has a history, and this is very much the case with genres of writing. So it'll be good for us to go back in time and explore when Americans' interest in biography began and to seek an answer to a central question, which is, what are we really talking about when we talk about biography? What is biography? Scott Casper is just the scholar to help us. Scott is both a historian and a biographer. In fact, in addition to serving as a professor of history and a dean at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Scott has written two books, one of which is a biography, Sarah Johnson's Mount Vernon, The Forgotten History of an American Shrine, and the other, Constructing American Lives, Biography and Culture in 19th Century America is a history of biography in the United States. It is not then in the glare of public, but in the shade of private life that we are to look for the man. Private life is always real life. Behind the curtain, where the eyes of the million are not upon him, and where a man can have no motive but inclination, no incitement but honest nature. There, he will always be sure to act himself. Consequently, if he act greatly, he must be great indeed. Hence, it has been justly said that our private deeds, if noble, are noblest of our lives. Scott Casper, thank you so much for joining us for our exploration of biography. Now, I wonder if we could begin with your interest in biography. You've written and co-written books about this genre. Why are you so interested in it? What drew you to biography and why do you think readers are so captivated by it? I think I probably started reading biographies when I was about four or five years old. And what I remember from about the age of five or six is reading biographies of the presidents of the United States and the first ladies of the United States 
and then any other biographies I could get my hands on. I think that that's what led me to history in the first place as a very small child. And I think my fascination was in the human stories. What were the obstacles people had faced? What were the characteristics that people had exhibited that led them ultimately to become the people they were or to achieve the things they did? So for me, that was how it started. I think readers are interested in many of the same things. Readers are interested in the person behind the story and the person behind the accomplishments, and maybe also interested in how that person is or is not like themselves, or what that person's story can offer to the reader herself or himself. I think all of those are reasons for the fascination. Now, your book, Constructing American Lives, is a history of biography in the United States. What is the history of biography in the United States? When did Americans start reading and writing biography? I think the answer to that begins with the notion that genres do have histories, that a genre, whether we're talking about biography or the novel or poetry, isn't the same thing across space and time. And so if we start with that, we can ask, what did biography look like, say, in 1800 in the United States? And how is that different from how it looks in, say, 1900? The first biographies in, we should call it British North America, appeared before there was an American Revolution. So, for example, in Puritan New England, there were spiritual biographies of leading religious figures. The most famous is this compendium published, I think, in the late 1600s called Magnalia Christi Americana by one of the Mathers about the religious figures who had made their way into the American colonies. The biographies I'm interested in constructing American lives really begin after the American Revolution, when authors are trying to create a sense of cultural nationalism in the new United States. So we see, for example, around 1788 or 1789, biographical articles that appear in some of the earliest American magazines of early American historical figures. Jeremy Belknap, who's a New England writer, publishes a compendium called American Biography around the same time, which is often thought of as the first American biographical compendium. So what we might think of as nationalistic American biography really begins in the aftermath of the revolution and the creation of the new nation. So biographies had a purpose. Has the purpose and mission of biographies in the United States changed over time? In the early decades of the United States, the missions of American biography in particular were didactic and nationalistic. That is, biographers aimed to teach the reader how to be a good Republican citizen through the life and model of the subject of the biography. A good example of this is Mason Locke Weems' biography of George Washington, best known for the cherry tree story and various other stories that made George Washington into a model for children. But it wasn't just Weems. Biographers in the early American Republic really focused on their subjects as models for emulation and models for admiration as the people who had helped create the new nation. So, for example, we see biographers demonstrating the ways in which eminent men, and they were usually men, acted in public and for the public good, because the idea of being a Republican citizen was very much focused on the public sphere, how one acted in public was how one's character was defined. And the notions of character will change over the 19th century. And this, in fact, provoked a kind of disagreement about what biography was supposed to do, because the leading models from Great Britain at this time emphasized something very different. The leading British theorist of biography in the 18th century was the writer Samuel Johnson, who argued in several quite influential essays that biographers should find the subject in his domestic privacies. That is, by looking at the subject's 
private life and private character, you would get the surest indication of that person's real life or real self. This flew at odds with the Republican notion of biography, which was all about performance on the public stage. And so what you see in the early American Republic are biographies being written in the United States that don't look much at all like what the leading British theorist of biography is proposing. And critics of biography in the early American Republic take different positions on that issue. I thought Mason Lock Weems might come up during our conversation. Now, this is a man who has become kind of infamous among historians, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about him and why historians don't seem to like him very much. Mason Weems is a fascinating character. He's a parson who's also one of the first great American marketers and salespeople. And he gets his start marketing by writing various kinds of short books and short essays that he peddles around the countryside. He connects with various publishers to sell their books around the American countryside. In fact, many books at this time, now we're talking about the late 1790s and the first decade of the 19th century, a number of publishers were trying to sell their books by subscription. One of the most famous examples in this period being Chief Justice John Marshall's five-volume biography of George Washington. So Weems is a traveling bookseller for the publisher of Marshall's Life of Washington. And he's also a writer himself. And because he knows his audiences, he knows the people in American rural areas whom he has preached to. He goes around the countryside preaching sermons, and then he'll sell people copies of those sermons or of other sermons. So he's an early American kind of cultural nationalist and also cultural entrepreneur. And I think he has become infamous among historians because his biography of George Washington and several of the other biographies he wrote are based upon a fair bit of, shall we say, authorial license, romance, not necessarily the kind of historical fact that we would associate with historians' work. But what's important to understand is that in his own context, Mason Locke Weems was writing books that were designed as school books. They were designed as didactic texts to teach young Americans how to live more than they were designed as historical document-based works. So I think if we're criticizing Mason Weems's works for being bad history or inauthentic history, we're probably not taking him on his own terms. On his own terms, he was doing exactly what he planned to do. And what he planned to do was teach American youth how to live their lives in wholesome and Republican and Christian ways. And he, by all accounts, he was pretty successful at that. His books sold far more copies than certainly Marshall's five-volume Life of Washington or probably any other biography published in the United States in the first 30 years of the 19th century. I wonder if you would tell us a bit more about the similarities and differences between Weems's biography on Washington and John Marshall's biography on Washington. Because it seems like Weems produced a one-volume biography, whereas Marshall produced a much larger five-volume work. And I'm curious about this because both were examples of early biographies in the United States, and historians just don't seem to remember Marshall as a biographer in quite the same way that they remember Weems. And there's a good reason for that, and it's that Marshall wasn't a very good biographer. Marshall's biography of Washington, all five volumes of it, barely mentions Washington in volume one. And it dispenses with Washington's entire early life in just a few pages. Marshall was really interested in telling the history of the United States through George Washington, not telling the life of George Washington. And by the fifth volume of Marshall's Life of Washington, he is really telling the story of Washington's presidential administration in a way that's very sympathetic to the Federalists. So Marshall's five-volume Life of Washington was a different kind of thing entirely. It was absolutely based upon sources. Marshall read Washington's papers. He read various other papers. And so it is a scholarly work. And at the same time, it is more a work of history than a work of biography. And it's a relatively partisan work. Weems's book, by contrast, is short. Its first edition, which is published within 
months of Washington's death. Its first edition is fewer than 100 pages, and the cherry tree story isn't even in it yet. It's not until the later editions in the first decade of the 19th century, I believe it's about the sixth or the eighth edition, when he expands the size of the book to about 220 or 230 pages, and he includes a number of the stories that are now most associated with this work. So the story of the cherry tree is one of the good examples, and there are various others. And Weems is interested in focusing on Washington in a way that Marshall really isn't because Marshall's interested in this broader sweep of history. Weems is not interested in the broader sweep of history. In fact, Weems at points even sounds almost like a Samuel Johnson biographer. I want to tell you about Washington's private life, his childhood and so on, in order for you to understand the person he was and he became. Johnson would probably not have called that a good example of Johnsonian biography because he isn't doing it really to understand Washington better. He's doing it to give lessons in good moral behavior to children. But one of the biggest differences, I would say, is Weems really is trying to write biography. Marshall is writing some other kind of hybrid of biography and history that tilts way more toward historical writing. And because it's five volumes long, because it is a slog, it was not a financial success, although there's clear evidence from various library records that people did read it. You know, as you were talking about John Marshall's biography and how Marshall sought to tell the history of the United States more than he tried to tell the life story of Washington, I was struck by a thought, which is a lot of historians do that today. They use the life of a person to really talk about or reveal something or make a big point about history. So, what is the difference between biography and history? What makes these two historical genres different from each other? I think it comes back to the author's goals. So I'll take an example. Robert Caro's biography of Lyndon Johnson, which is, I think, four volumes done and one volume to go. Clearly, it's biography in as much as it takes the life of one individual as the center of the story. And even when there are diversions from that story, even when there are stories of the broader history that come into play, it's always about Lyndon Johnson at root. And I think a biographer at root is interested in the person at the center of the story. Historians, I think, tend to ask different kinds of questions, less questions about who was this person and what difference did she or he make on the past and more about, say, why did the past turn out the way it did? These questions are not mutually exclusive. Historians and biographers overlap in asking them. But I think one of the big differences is how the story is structured. Is the story structured as the life of an individual or a group of individuals? Or is it structured around, say, social or political change over time with individuals' stories being woven in as they make sense? So, you know, in some ways, my book, Constructing American Lives, is a historian's book about biography, but it's not itself a work of biography because it's really about the way this genre changes over time. It has little biographical vignettes built in about some of the major biographers, such as Weems and others, but it's a work of history. That's a good example of how you know, I could be writing a history of something, but it's not biography at the same time. You mentioned that there's overlap in the questions that historians and biographers ask. Do you think there's any overlap in the methods that biographers and historians use to research and write their works too? I think they both overlap and have different methods. So, for example, they overlap in our modern conceptions of the two. They overlap in relying upon research and relying upon verification of information and sources. So good biography ought to be based on the same depth of research as good history. They overlap, I think, in being interested in stories. The framework for those stories might differ, but historians are interested in stories just as biographers are. I think historians who aren't writing biography may structure their works differently. So they might structure their works in terms of change over time in a place or in an institution or in a certain way of life, whereas biographers will always have the individual at the center. 
But there's a lot of overlap. There are historians who write biography, and so the story is the story of an individual told over time. Sometimes another way to think about it is which predominates, the individual or that individual's context. The more you're moving toward emphasis on the context, the more you may be moving away from what we might think of strictly as biography. But it's a blurry line. You noted that good biography ought to be based on the same depth of research as good history. Is it possible to write a good biography without relying on stories that others tell about a person, you know, without the anecdotal evidence? I'd say those can be helpful, but they're probably not sufficient. And of course, depending upon whose biography we're writing, we may not have others to turn to. So if I were writing a biography of somebody who lived in the 19th century, I would probably be dependent on the 19th century sources, whether those are written and printed sources or maybe archaeological sources and others. If you're writing a biography of a living character or a recently deceased character, I think the recollections of others would be absolutely crucial. In fact, to go back to my earlier example, this has been a critical source for Robert Caro in his biographies of Lyndon Johnson. He's known as an extraordinary interviewer who has managed to track down, it would seem, almost anybody alive who ever knew Lyndon Johnson. And what he does, and he does very successfully, I think, is compare those stories with one another and also use the printed record, the documentary record, in order to gauge the accuracy and the integrity of the stories he's being told by those who knew Johnson. So I think if you're going to use other people's reminiscences, other people's impressions, part of your obligation is to figure out how far you can trust those, what their own points of view might be, so that you can then write your biography based on as full and whole a rendering as possible. You know, it just occurred to me that thus far, we've really been talking about the obligations of a biographer to the reader. And now I wonder, does a reader have any obligations to a biographer? Wow, that's a good question. And I think the answer changes over time. So, for example, in the early 19th century, biographers and critics would have said that the reader's obligation is to learn from the biography and to gain from the biography lessons about how to live her or his life. Whether it's a biography of a pious woman who had been a missionary to India or whether it's George Washington, the reader's obligation was to gain lessons from the biography. I think that today that obligation, that sense of obligation is primarily associated with children's reading of biography, with the notion that when a first grade teacher assigns a biography to his or her students, it might be in part to give the students life lessons. I think that in other ways, the reader's obligations today are very much shaped by developments that begin in the mid-19th century and really take hold in the early to mid-20th, developments about a biography providing us with a kind of imaginative relationship with its subject. That is, by reading the biography, we gain a kind of acquaintanceship with the subject of that biography, not necessarily that we will gain lessons in how to live our own lives from that, but maybe we will gain inspiration, gain ideas, and gain knowledge about the past. And a big part of biography today, I think, is about just gaining knowledge of people who might be in situations and circumstances different from our own and how they dealt with those circumstances. I think that's what draws people in. Now that we've talked a bit about the methods of biography, I'd like for us to return to something you said earlier. When I asked you about your interest in biography, you said that you came to your interest by reading the biographies of presidents. Presidents always seem to have biographies written about them, and some historians have even dubbed this kind of biography great man history. Why is it that we have so many biographies written about men? I think there are several reasons for that. One is that biographies were, throughout history, thought to be about people who had become famous typically on the public stage, and through much of history, those people tended to be men. And so that's the first reason. A second reason, I think, has had to do with what people perceived as 
the extent and limits of the sources. And I think we know now that many of the same sources that were long used to tell the stories of men, and especially white men or men in positions of power, can be read against the grain to tell very different kinds of stories, as Annette Gordon-Reed does probably more brilliantly than anybody else. And so I think part of it was that biographies were about people in power. If you look, however, at the early 19th century, one of the interesting things you find is that there are many biographies written of women in the first half of the 19th century, and they tend to be about women who exhibited their piety in some way, whether as missionaries or as fairly typical church women and so on. And these biographies were often written by ministers for the same reasons that other writers took as their subjects men who had been distinguished in the public sphere, that is to provide lessons for a rising generation. So to provide lessons for a rising generation of young women, people wrote religious biographies of female religious figures. And so you do see biographies of women, but they take very different kinds of women as their subjects in the first half of the 19th century, and they're aimed at teaching somewhat different kinds of lessons. I think what we have learned over the last, say, 30 or 40 years is that there is just endless room and opportunity to tell the stories of people whose stories had not been told before, people who didn't have power, people whose power was exerted behind the scenes, people whose stories tell us something about their period that we cannot learn by reading the biographies of presidents or generals or kings. Now, earlier we explored how the goals of biography have shifted over time that the goals really depended on a particular time and what people were really interested in. Where do you think biography stands today? What goals do you think American biographers have for their work today? Depends on which biographer we're asking about. Some biographers today are interested in recovering as fully as they can the life of the person they're writing about. And that today typically means recovering the person's motivations, recovering the person's sense of who they were and what they aimed to do, how well they succeeded or didn't succeed in doing what they did, but really getting at the inner person. And that's a notion that goes back to the 19th century, the notion of the inner man. How do we get at the person underneath what we knew in public? And I think a lot of biographers today are interested in doing that. Of course, many biographies today are celebrity biographies. And celebrity biographies are out predominantly to provide interested readers with more information about somebody they like or somebody they want to know more about. And sometimes that information is the more sensationalistic, the better. So I think that's a different kind of biography today. It's not necessarily a historical biography. It's not necessarily a scholarly work, but it's a work that appeals to momentary interest in a particular figure. So there, there are multiple kinds of biographies even today. Chapter 2. Birth and Education. To show how Washington grew up to become the great man. <laughs> the perfect place for that story of young George and his father's cherry tree. Pa, said George very seriously. Do I ever tell lies? No, George. I thank God you do not, my son and I rejoice in the hope that you never will. At least, you shall never, from me, have cause to be guilty of so shameful a thing. What are we really talking about when we talk about biography? What is biography? According to Scott, the answer to these questions depends on time and place. For 17th century New Englanders, biographies showcased the lives of religious leaders and taught religious and moral lessons. For late 18th and early 19th century Americans, biographies were similarly didactic, but also nationalistic. They taught lessons about how to live and behave like good Republican citizens. And they accomplished this task by featuring the lives of great men and founding fathers like George Washington. But even within this larger nationalistic goal, we can see variation in early American biographies. For example, Mason Locke Weems wrote his biography, The Life of George Washington, primarily to teach young Americans how to grow up to be good Republican citizens. To accomplish this goal, 
Wayne centered his biography on Washington's private life, or at least the private life he thought Washington must have had, all in order to show children how Washington grew into the leader he became. John Marshall, on the other hand, another early biographer of Washington, took a different approach. He wrote a five-volume work that used Washington to tell the history of the early United States. Where Weems had focused on Washington's private life, Marshall focused on the events and institutions Washington participated in. And it's this focus that really makes Marshall's work a history, not a biography. As Scott revealed, the difference between history and biography often comes down to the author's goals. Weems wanted to show children Washington's private life so he could illustrate how he developed his good Republican character. Marshall wanted to tell the story of how the United States came to be in a manner that was favorable to members of his own political party, the Federalists. In general, histories focus on social and political change over time, while biographies focus on the life of an individual or group of individuals. And although they may be different in structure, histories and biographies really should be similar in the ways that their authors conducted their work. Good histories and good biographies, at their core, are based on thorough and deep research. Which brings us to the purpose of biography today. Today, biographies are not meant to teach us life lessons or encourage us to develop a sense of national feeling and belonging. Instead, most modern biographies are meant to show us a person's goals and how they failed or succeeded in achieving them. Like Weems, biographers want us to know about a person's private, personal life so that we can get to know them as people. Of course, that's just the mission of historical biography. The mission of present-day celebrity biographies is quite different. Our conversation with Scott revealed that the nature and meaning of biography changes across time and cultures, which should make us wonder, what does biography look like in different places? Now, we can't explore what biography looks like in every country, but we can venture out and see what it looks like in one different place. And since Scott told us that American traditions of biography hail from England and the United Kingdom, it seems like we should go across the pond and explore what biography looks like there and how its meanings of biography have changed over time. Plus, by looking at English and British traditions, we should be able to see more clearly the continuities and differences between the two biographical cultures. Now, I think we should call on Flora Frazier to guide us. Flora is a professional writer and biographer. In fact, she's a third-generation biographer, as both her grandmother, Elizabeth Longford, and her mother, Lady Antonia Frazier, were also biographers. Flora has written five biographies, four of them about elite women, which means Flora can also help us explore how the nature of biography changes or doesn't change when they're written about elite women. Now, you may have heard of some of Flora's biographies. They include The Princesses, The Daughters of George III, and most recently, The Washingtons. George and Martha, joined by friendship, crowned in love, which won the 2016 George Washington Book Prize. She's also at work on a sixth biography about the life of Flora MacDonald, an 18th century Scottish heroine who became embroiled in the American Revolution. The following anecdote is a case in point. It is too valuable to be lost and too true to be doubted, for it was communicated to me by the same excellent lady to whom I am indebted for the last. When George, said she, was about six years old, he was made the wealthy master of a hatchet, of which, like most little boys, he was immoderately fond, and was constantly going about chopping everything that came in his way. One day, in the garden, where he often amused himself hacking his mother's pea sticks, he unluckily tried the edge of his hatchet on the body of a beautiful young English cherry tree, which he barked so terribly that I don't believe the tree ever got the better of it. The next morning, the old gentleman found out what had befallen his tree, which, by the by, was a great favorite, came into the house, and with much warmth asked for the mischievous author, declaring at the same time that he would not have taken five guineas for his tree. Presently, George and his hatchet made their appearance. Thank you for joining us, Flora Frazier. Now, you're a professional biographer, and I wonder, what sparked your great interest in biography? It really goes back to my childhood, I think you could say, because growing up between London and Scotland in the 1960s, I was an avid reader, and there was a golden age of historical fiction for children. Our local library had a wonderful series called the young 
Horatio Nelson, the young Florence Nightingale, the young Queen Victoria, the young Elizabeth Fry. So my sister and I would ferry these books back and forward to our local library, reading through the entire series, but also reading stories from British history, whether it was Scottish history of the 18th century or Tudor history. So that was very character driven. And we spent a lot of time going to castles in England and in Scotland and battlefields. We were never out of a battlefield. And our parents, my mother English, my father Scottish, would tell us the stories with great enthusiasm of the people who lived and fought in these places. So I was very alive to the history of the British Isles growing up. So it was in a way a childhood very rich in history. So I think I naturally approach history through the medium of biography. And of course, my childhood and youth was writing biography, Mary Queen of Scots, Charles II, and my grandmother, Elizabeth Longford, was producing Life of Queen Victoria from papers in the Royal Archives and a Life of the Duke of Wellington. So I knew that books came out of study of individuals and that if you studied these individuals for long enough, a book came out of it. And then you, in a sense, moved on to another person to study. I was like someone who was born into a family firm. And my choice was to join that family firm or reject it. So I rather fell into writing biography. But 35 years later, I'm very glad that I did because I wake up every morning full of enthusiasm for what I do. Wow. It sounds like you had a very character driven childhood. And that's something about biography, right? The people we research in uses windows onto the past really make the past seem character driven. Like you get a better understanding about the castles and the battlefields you visit because you really have a feel for the human side, the people who lived in those castles and who fought on those battlefields. Yes. And another way I think you get a feel for the person is by reading what they have written or what their contemporaries have written about them. It varies. Some of the people I've written about have been tremendous letter writers, and others, there are periods in their life, their letters don't survive. But you can turn to the diaries and letters of others with descriptions of them. And what I, in all my books, have tried to be is a kind of midwife to bring the voices of these characters. And I write about women principally and some men in the 18th century to bring their voices onto the page for the 20th, 21st century reader to really hear their voices. I think that's one of the most important things that one can do as a biographer going into archives and finding those voices. My narrative, as I'm telling the life of the women I write about, is to give a context to these women's lives, the broader historical context, give the times in which they lived. And there's that interesting balance between how far did their character derive the events of their lives? And was it just circumstance which drove the lives? Were they passive? Were they active? And so all of the women that I've written about were involved in great national conflicts. So Emma Hamilton lived and was caught up with Admiral Nelson, her lover, in the Napoleonic Wars. Martha Washington, of course, was at headquarters every winter of the war with her husband and all his aides de camp. Queen Caroline, George IV's wife, who I've written about, her father was one of the heroes on the 
other side fighting in the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, the daughters of George III, the six daughters who I've written about, lived with their father through the American Revolution as seen from the British side. So in my books, there's national conflict, at least in the background, and there are strong male figures in my life of Pauline Bonaparte, of course, her brother, the Emperor Napoleon, is frankly the person she loves most, more than either of her husbands. And so it, I write about 18th century women because they were for a long time ignored the idea of soft power or influence wasn't appreciated as it is now in the 19th century when biographers were writing about all the male figures I've mentioned. It was the man and the monument and the monumental achievements which were the focus of biography and the private lives which interest us today as much as the monumental achievements were not thought fit material for biographies. So I write about women in a sense because the women of the 18th century have not received their due. You mentioned that all of the women you've researched and written about were involved in great periods of national conflict. And typically, when we study periods of national conflict, we usually do so by viewing them through the eyes of men. So how does viewing these events through the eyes of women change how we view these events? Perhaps you could give us an example? Yes. The most obvious example, I suppose, is viewing the Napoleonic Wars through the eyes of Napoleon's sister Pauline, because as a result of the French Wars and that long period from the French Revolution in 1789 to the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, Pauline was sent off to Haiti with her husband to recover the sugar empire for France. Her husband died there of yellow fever. So that is a conflict in which she's having to manage as a wife and then a widow and shows enormous bravery in this hideous conflict where Haiti, having been free, is now being recovered by the French with the aid of Pauline's husband, the general who leads the expedition. And then she remarries and becomes Princess Borghese, marries an Italian prince. And then she is there to sustain her brother when he's defeated in 1814 and sent to Elba. And she, alone of the many brothers and sisters who've profited from the empire and they've been made kings of Spain and queens of Naples. She goes to Elba and is there to comfort and also to keep up the imperial, if you like, pretense in this tiny island of Elba, which he's been exiled to. And later, after he's exiled and never returns from Mount St. Helena in the Atlantic, Pauline, who's leading a fairly comfortable life in Rome, hears that he's gravely ill and writes to the British Prime Minister, he's a British prisoner out in St. Helena, and says that she wishes permission to go to St. Helena. She follows his fortunes throughout his rise and then his fall as closely, really, as if she were a general on the battlefield. So they're off stage. They're not generals. They're not prime ministers. These women I write about. But in the 18th century, there were no government offices to go to until the end of the century. Men, whatever their positions, worked at home. And so the women in the 18th century are very much there for the decisions taken over the dining table, late afterwards over the tea table, they're with their husbands, with if they're the sisters or the daughters, they're there 
while decisions are being made. The 19th century, which sees this division between the female sphere and the male sphere, doesn't exist. And for that reason, the 18th century is very interesting just because you have the women so closely involved in the decision making at a high level. At some point earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that women weren't seen as fit material for biography during the 19th century. And this raises a question about the traditions of biography. Would you tell us about the tradition of biography in the United Kingdom and how you see the evolution of that tradition over time? Yes, that's a very interesting question, because in this country, there was this long classical tradition. So Greek and Roman texts like Plutarch's Parallel Lives of Greeks and Romans, that continued, if you like, to influence the first group biography, if you like. And on the continent, there was Vasari's Lives of the Artists, another group biography. And here in the 17th century, John Aubrey wrote his brief lives about his 17th century contemporaries. So those were early, I mean, we're talking, you know, across the centuries, but those were early biographical works, but which were much admired. And as time went on, you have these biographies written by men, some of them academics, but most of them men of letters rather than academics, amateurs, if you like. And there were a number of hugely influential biographies which set the bar, I suppose. And Carlyle's Life of Frederick the Great. Later, there was Lytton Strachey's Eminent Victorians. So these were biographies still extremely readable, but they were concerned with the man and the monument. And I would say that my Mother Antonia Fraser and my grandmother Elizabeth Longford were in a wave of female biographers who went into archives in the 1960s and produced lives of women. My mother has written on Marie Antoinette as well as Mary Queen of Scots. My grandmother produced Queen Victoria, but she also produced the marvellous two-volume biography of the Duke of Wellington. So they were writing about men as well as women, great and famous queens and empresses. Yes, there have always been biographies of Elizabeth I. But my mother and grandmother were interested as wives and mothers themselves by the private side of the men and women they were writing about. And that new tradition continued. More recent books by Stella Tilliard, Aristocrats, and Amanda Foreman, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, dealt again both with the political and the private. So a new style, if you like, of biography, I think it's fair to say, emerged. And male biographers also focused more on the private as well as the public side of their lives. And now there's absolutely you know, no difference. Men write about women, women write about men. But the other development, which I would say has taken place, historical biography has always been in this country for the general reader. It's always aimed at the general reader. Anyone, in a sense, can write a historical biography. There's only one rule of engagement, if you like, for a biographer, is that anyone with a maybe a high school education, but not even that much, must be able to enjoy and fully comprehend the biography. So it's not for the specialist. It really is designed for the general reader. And that's a sort of implicit rule when you look at all the new biographies on the shelves of bookstores. They're all absolutely accessible to anyone. You've touched on this a bit throughout our entire conversation, but 
Would you take us through your process of writing a biography? When you're trying to tell the life of someone, how do you go about telling their life, you know, getting into their head and conveying their life to your readers? I believe that there is no better arc to a biography than starting with the cradle and ending at the grave. Others have different approaches, but I also do like to get into the story. I try not to use the two words would have. In other words, writing a sentence like, she would have felt delighted to see him. I mean, I don't think I'd ever have written that. So I'm interested in what we know, not in what I'm imagining this person might have felt. So I'm quite rigorous about taking, at the end of my research, what I actually know about this woman's life and setting it out. But into that comes a great deal of research. I research all the places. I mean, I'm a great one for footstep research. So I go around as far as possible everywhere that my subject is known to have gone where possible. When I was writing Emma Hamilton, who lived as the wife of the British ambassador in Naples for many years, I spent many two-week periods in Naples and in the surroundings where her life took her. And it wasn't only going to the individual places, it was to be there where she had been. And of course, you look at the scenery through rose-tinted glasses because you're imagining it as it was in that case in the 1780s. But you're imagining it with the aid of a great deal of study of paintings, of descriptions, either by her or by hundreds of travelers to Naples in that period. So you're building up a picture. You're mooring them in their life, in their surroundings, so that you, as far as possible, come to know the place, if possible, in which Martha Washington received a letter. So you build up almost a three-dimensional portrait of their life, and that informs your writing. And it's hard to say how it does inform your writing, but it gives you the certainty with which to write. And it does mean that you rule out fancy. And by fancy, I mean these speculatory remarks like, he would have felt great joy to receive her letter. I mean, we have absolutely no idea. So let's not go there. I will speculate about other matters, how Admiral Lord Nelson could have brought himself with Emma to be so cruel to the wife he left, how George IV could bring himself to be so vindictive to his wife, Queen Caroline, and how could Queen Caroline be so unmaternal as to leave her daughter and go abroad? I mean, those things are areas where I do speculate. So, yeah, I think a great deal, and I do research for probably a minimum of two years before I come to write. And when I write, it takes me ages to get going. It's really clear when we hear you talk about your process, Flora, that you believe that thorough research makes for good writing and good biographies. But I wonder about the role of objectivity. When historians approach their historical research and writing, they try to do so with objectivity. And I wonder, do biographers likewise approach historical research and writing with objectivity? Yes. I think as a biographer, you have a role as a champion of your subject, but a critical champion, if that's possible. I think that it's important to show them warts and all, as the phrase is. But where I say you're the critical champion is when you're pointing up their failings, you're interested where that failing weakness drives them, where it might originate from, just as you're interested in their strengths. 
So I think you are looking at them objectively. There are, I think, times when I've been writing each of the biographies I've produced that I've been dismayed by my subject's conduct and even repelled. But that's part of almost like a long friendship with them. You're looking at every inch of their life. They're hardly going to be solid virtue all the way through. And if they were, I'm afraid I probably wouldn't be writing about them. So can one really be objective about them? I think in a way you've already chosen to write about them from a huge cast of other characters. So you've made some kind of you know, commitment to them. And I think it's that commitment that matters. George, said his father, do you know who killed that beautiful little cherry tree yonder in the garden? This was a tough question, and George staggered under it for a moment, but quickly recovered himself, and looking at his father, with the sweet face of youth, brightened with the inexpressible charm of all-conquering truth, he bravely cried out, I can't tell a lie, Pa, you know I can't tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. Run to my arms, you dearest boy, cried his father in transports. Run to my arms. Glad am I, George, that you killed my tree, for you have paid me for it a thousandfold. Such an act of heroism in my son is more worth than a thousand trees, though blossomed with silver and their fruits of purest gold. Great Britain has a long tradition of biography, which, as Flora noted, began with the Greek and Latin texts of Plutarch's lives of the noble Grecians and Romans. Written at the start of the second century, Plutarch's texts features 23 pairs of biographies of famous Greek and Roman men, as well as four unpaired single-life descriptions. And all of these men possessed moral virtues or failings Plutarch wanted his readers to know about. Now, much like American biographers, 19th century British biographers tended to be educated amateurs who focused their research and writing on the man and the monument. They wanted to convey the great deeds and public lives of British and European men. But these biographers' focus on men left a sizable gap in biography that 20th century women biographers like Elizabeth Longford and Lady Antonia Fraser were happy to fill. Flora's grandmother and mother produced biographies about women. As wives and mothers, they were interested in the private lives of both famous women and the men in their lives. Now, just as Scott Casper related about the United States, biography in Great Britain has gone from an interest in private life to an interest in public life, back to an interest in private life. Today, Britons are just as fascinated as Americans are with the private lives of individuals, as well as in the stories of men and women. And it was interesting to hear Flora discuss what we can learn about history when we take the time to explore the lives of women. For example, during the 18th century, there was no separation between public and private spheres. Men worked at home and the women in their lives were there by their side to observe and help them make important decisions. This is why Flora enjoys writing about women in this era. While not primary holders and wielders of power, women exercised a soft power over the men in their lives. They observed and participated in different events like the American Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. And we do well to look at their lives and actions because they offer us not just a somewhat different view and take on an area of interest. They offer us an opportunity to expand our view and understanding of historic periods, events, and people that fascinate us. Now, it's clear from our conversation with Flora that a great deal of research goes into writing a historical biography. To write a good biography, authors really have to go into the archives and read the papers their subjects left behind as well as those papers that discuss their subject and the period they lived in. Which raises a few questions. How does a biographer approach their sources? How did they sort through all the materials left behind by somebody who was prolific? And how do they get at the life story of those who left little by way of a paper trail? I can think of someone who can shed light on this for us. In fact, Scott mentioned her as being an exemplar of a biographer who knows how to approach historical sources to get at the lives of those who didn't leave many sources behind. In fact, she does this so well, she's won multiple awards for her work, including a Pulitzer Prize. 
Annette Gordon-Reed is the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School and a professor of history at Harvard University. She's co-authored two books and authored four, including Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, and The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family, which won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History. And we'll speak with Annette right after we take just a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. Biography is one of our favorite ways to learn about history, but telling the story of an individual is not an easy task. As we've been hearing from our guests, biographers have to weigh how to shape an individual's story, along with how that story shapes the reader's understanding of the historical period in which that individual lived. For example, John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court and an aspiring biographer himself, really struggled with this task. Marshall wrote an early five-volume biography of George Washington, but as Scott Casper related, Marshall's work turned out to be more of a history than a biography, as Marshall focused on the events and institutions Washington participated in, not on the details of Washington's life. Now, while not an accomplished biographer, Marshall stands as a very accomplished Chief Justice, and we'll explore his life in greater detail with two of his biographers in the next two episodes of the Doing History biography series. In the meantime, you can learn more about the fourth Chief Justice by visiting the website of today's sponsor, the John Marshall Foundation. On their website, you'll find videos, study guides, and many other ways to learn about Marshall and his times. You'll also find a newly re-released version of the book, American Statesman John Marshall by Alan B. Magruder, which is available for free. The John Marshall Foundation was established in 1987 by a group of dedicated lawyers and corporate leaders, the Virginia Bar Association, and Preservation Virginia in order to steward the legacy of the great Chief Justice. Since then, they have assembled an impressive portfolio of tools for teachers, students, and anyone who is interested in learning more about Marshall. So go to their website, johnmarshallfoundation.org, to check out the videos, transcriptions, suggested readings, and much more, including Alan B. Magruder's American Statesman John Marshall for free. Again, to access these free resources, visit johnmarshallfoundation.org. Chapter 8. Character of Washington When the children of the years to come, hearing his great name re-echoed from every lip, shall say to their fathers, What was it that raised Washington to such height of glory? Let them be told that it was his great talents, constantly guided and guarded by religion. In the winter of 77, while Washington with the American army lay encamped at Valley Forge, a certain good old friend of the respectable family and name of Potts, if I mistake not, had occasion to pass through the woods near headquarters. Treading in his way along the venerable grove, suddenly he heard the sound of a human voice, which, as he advanced, increased on his ear, and at length became like the voice of one speaking much in earnest. As soon as he approached the spot with a cautious step, whom should he behold, in the dark natural bower of ancient oaks, but the commander-in-chief of the American armies, on his knees at prayer? Motionless with surprise, friend Potts continued on the place till the general, having ended his devotions, arose, and with a countenance of angelic serenity, retired to headquarters. Annette Gordon-Reed, thank you for helping us explore biography as a genre. Glad to be here. Now, you often use people as windows onto the early American past, and you've written about people using the genre of biography and the genre of history. Would you tell us about the differences between these two genres of historical writing and why you choose to write about some people with biography and others through historical narrative? Well, I really try to blend the historical moment. I think good biographies try to bring the context of a person's life into view. You spend much more time with an individual with a biography. You're thinking about the person's life, trying to discern motivations. You are having to imagine what it was like to be this person. So I think that's one of the tasks of a biographer. And it's the kind of thing that makes things that make historians somewhat skeptical of biography, because you don't do that so much when you're writing about, say, the Civil War as a topic or the American Revolutionary War. You're not really inside of a person or trying to get to the essence of an individual. You're trying to get to the essence of a moment. And that's 
a much larger enterprise. The context matters much, much more. With a biography, you do bring in context, but you can't go too far away from the person's life. You know, you can't spend too many pages explaining something and then, oh, yes, I'm talking about this person, then come back to them. It's a much more delicate balance between an inner focus and a larger, larger focus on a context. And I like to bring them together as much as possible because I think they help one another. Writing about a time, a place, if you can sometimes zoom in on a person and then zoom back out, that's a good thing. But a biography that doesn't take account of the context is really not great. It just becomes one thing after another in a person's life. And that's kind of boring and it's not really illuminating. You know, you mentioned that one of the things you try to do as a biographer is get inside a person's head because you're really writing about the person. And of course, when the person's dead, the best way to get to know them is through the documentary and material evidence that's left behind. Does the availability of this evidence impact how a biographer approaches their sources and whether they choose to write a biography of a person or a history with a person? Yes. Writing about Jefferson, someone who left lots of documents, someone that lots of people talked about and gave their opinions on, that's very different from writing about Sally Hemings, for example, or members of her family, because you have to try to pull together as much as you can about the person from what documentary sources are there. You're forced to rely sometimes on actions, interpreting people's actions, as opposed to what they said, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. You know, if you can pull together sort of repeated actions or moments where you know a person is doing something over and over again, I think you can infer there's more inference that's involved in that kind of situation. And you have to kind of write around the person. When I talked about Elizabeth Hemings, for example, the matriarch of the Hemings family, there's absolutely nothing from her about her life. But I can talk about the time that she lived in. She was said to have been the daughter of an African woman, maybe a person who actually had been born in Africa. Well, I could look at Williamsburg at that time and find that the year that she was born was sort of the high point of importation of Africans into that region. I can sort of talk about what that time must have been like. We don't know her life exactly, but we know the milieu. And I think that gives readers something. And so long as you're telling people or telling the readers, you know, what you're doing that, you know, we don't know about her, but here's the thing that we know about her surrounding community, then I think that that's valuable as well. That's better than saying we have no letters, we have nothing from her, and so therefore we can't know anything about her life. We can know something about the place where she grew up and what people like her experienced. And I think that that's valuable for a reader as well. So there's much more inferential reasoning that has to be done there. And I think as long as you are upfront about that, the reader can come along with you or not. But even with the writing, so looking at a person who's written a lot or a lot has been written about the individual, there's still a lot of parsing to be done. So there's strengths and weaknesses of writing about someone who has a lot of stuff versus someone who has very little stuff. Neither one is perfect. Of course, you want to have more information, but that still raises different questions about how you use the material. Do you just accept it because it's something that's written down? How far do you go to corroborate what has been said in a particular document? So there are strengths and weaknesses to both situations. While we're on the subject of biographical enterprise or all that work that a scholar or biographer needs to put into their study, I wonder if you would tell us what exactly a biographer needs in order to write about the life of a specific person or perhaps even a group of people. Curiosity, obviously. I think you need an even temperament. You need a certain degree of detachment. There's always the danger in writing about a person that you fall in love with the person or you fall in hate with the person. There's a, there's a genre of hate biographies. You have to be able to keep a sense of perspective that the person is not you and you are not writing a person's life in the way you wish he or she had gone through that life. You need some degree of empathy, I think. You can become exasperated with subjects, but you have to pull back from that and maintain a level of detachment. I think it's probably easier, again, when I'm making the comparison between, say, uh, a person, writing about a person or writing about an age or whatever, it's easier to follow with a person than, you know, a war, for example, or some large scale thing. And 
I just think detachment is key for a biographer. Detachment and at the same time, empathy for the human condition to realize that your person is first and foremost a human being. You know, I think it was Jill Lepore who said that it is possible for historians and biographers to love their subjects just a bit too much. And I wonder if you would tell us about this struggle or, you know, the work this involved for a biographer to maintain the level of detachment and objectivity you were just telling us about. Well, I think it might be easier for some subjects than others. My subject has been Jefferson. My subject has been the Hemings family. And the thing about Jefferson is that he offers so many things that you could love him for, but there are many other things that you could get really angry with him about. And so I think, you know, depending upon the subject, you have to sort of take everything that they're doing and see it in perspective, keep things in perspective. I think the easiest thing to do is to try to take all of these differing actions and see them as the actions of a human being and not place too much emphasis on them. Not, you know, to say he's all this or he's all that. There was a period of time when I was working on the Hemings family and some members of the family saw themselves as very close to Jefferson. John Hemings at one point tells on an enslaved person who has been stealing vegetables from the vegetable garden. He writes to Jefferson about this. And I'm thinking, you know, you're ratting out a fellow slave. But then you think about John Hemings and the fact that they all used that garden. And this person was taking something not just from Jefferson, he was taking something from John Hemings. And I also think, too, that I'm imposing my understanding of what John Hemings' relationship was to Jefferson on this situation. And John Hemings evidently had a completely different idea about what that relationship was. And since I'm not there, You know, I can't judge the day-to-day interactions. I can't see the way people looked at each other, the way people talked to each other. You have to have a degree of humility about those moments. I could be annoyed with John Hemings about this, you know, and I was for a day when I was writing this. I had to pull back and say, wait a minute, Annette, you're telling the story of these two people and you have to try to figure out what is going on between the two of them. You can't put yourself in the place of John Hemings as an African-American person and say, this is how you should have reacted to that particular moment. I don't know all that's at stake and I can't because I'm not there. So I think keeping in mind that, you know, you're not there, you're not really a part of it. You know these people, but you can't know them 100%. You have to have that degree of humility that lets you see these things as clearly or without as much input from your own values as possible. That work, you know, trying to maintain distance and objectivity from your subjects, sounds like it mostly takes place behind the scenes, you know, when you're thinking about how you're going to write something or what you're going to write. And as you were describing John Hemings and why he might have turned on a fellow enslaved person, I just couldn't help but wonder whether the biographer can help the reader keep some distance and objectivity too, you know, in the actual text. Yeah, the moments that I had struggles with Sally Hemings coming back from France with Jefferson or that kind of episode, if I'm remembering correctly, I do raise that question, you know, to ask the reader to think about this, but come back to the point that this is John Hemings and he knew Jefferson and Sally Hemings. She knew Thomas Jefferson and there are things that we can't know. Yeah, I probably do that more than other historians do. And I think it's because the people that I'm writing about, the reader should know that I'm writing about people who don't have a voluminous record to judge their behavior. So you write in a different way, I think, when you're dealing with subjects like that than you do, again, with Jefferson, where you can sort of go through a number of letters or other people's descriptions of him to try to figure out what the heck is going on there. So I think the key is being honest with the reader about what you're doing and upfront, and people come along with it. Now, in 2014, you wrote an article for the Women Mary Quarterly titled Writing American Lives as Biography. And in that article, you wrote, the history of the United States is most effectively told through the lives of people. And I wonder if you would just tell us, you know, why you think that's the case. Well, what I meant is that we're a country that doesn't have a long history, as long a history as Europe. We are still at the beginning of our origins, right? The connection is very, very close. And I think that by showing how different groups of people were treated in the United States, whether it's 
you know, white males and their power and privilege and white males who didn't have that power and privilege or enslaved people or women. We don't have the institutions that are like an organized church, for example, that you could talk about that goes for a thousand years or a monarchy that goes back, you know, a thousand years. We are still making who we are as a country. And a lot of that has to do with how people are treated, how people work together or don't work together, the privileges that some people have and that others don't have. You can say a lot about what this country means by looking at people and the way people have been treated. We don't yet have the kind of culture, I think, that sort of exists without the story of individuals in that culture. And I think that that will take time to get to that point. But to me, it's much more likely that you get a sense of the American story through the progress of an individual or individuals. That's why I think the Hemings family story, talking about a family saga, could tell you so much about slavery, about gender, about all those kinds of things through the progress of these individual people's lives. Could you expand on that point a bit more? What can we see about American life by looking at the biographies or the lives of people like the Hemingses that we simply can't see by just looking at the lives of powerful men like Thomas Jefferson? Well, I think with them, since it's generations of people, there are males and females in the family, it raises questions about the nature of life of women in the 18th century and the 19th century. The Hemingses are enslaved women, but a system of patriarchy affected them not just as African-American enslaved people, they affected them as women. You can see points of connection between the plight of a woman like Sally Hemings, who is attached to a much older man who has power and control over her. You're invited to think about Gabriella Harvey, for example, who is at the opposite end of the social spectrum, who is a 17-year-old, who is essentially married off to a 50-year-old man to combine the family property. She doesn't want to marry him. There was somebody else that she was in love with. And these women are very, very different. But there's some points of commonality because once she marries this guy, he is in control of her. And, you know, it's all about his power and how he wants to do things. Although she actually, I think, kind of controlled him in a certain way. I mean, she got him to disinherit his children with his first wife who died. But you asked, I think, to see how different people's lives were. But at the same time, particularly women, how much the same story is there, attached to a guy, having children, almost dying in childbirth or losing children, all those kinds of things that, you know, you can see with these people who are living side by side, but ostensibly are living very, very different types of lives. So I think looking at the Hemingses, you see stories of gender, you see a story of race, James Hemings, who was a supremely talented person a very intelligent person, but who ends up killing himself in the end after he's emancipated. We don't know why, but you can imagine what it was like to be a person like that, living in a society that really had no place for someone like him. He was literate. He'd been trained as a chef. He'd be the kind of person, if he were white, who could have gone on to you know, do really, really great things, but was limited because of his race. And so you can get a sense by looking at him, he who had many more advantages than other African-American people, how he was not able to make it. And think about the lives of other people who did not have near as many chances as he did. I know you've touched on this in some of your earlier responses, but just so we're specific about it, you've written about Thomas Jefferson, who left the world a lot of documentary records. And you've written about his non-white family, who left fewer records. Would you tell us a bit about Jefferson and the Hemingses and how you approached researching and writing about the lives of these very different figures who left behind very different documentary records? Well, unfortunately, well, I don't want to say unfortunately, but it's just the way it is. I had to start with Jefferson's records because he is the one who was the inveterate record keeper and his memorandum books, which he kept from the time he was in his 20s until his death, where he sort of recorded all of his expenditures tells us a lot about the day-to-day life. And he did this daily about all of his expenditures. We can't say every single one of them because obviously there may have been times he forgot or whatever, didn't want to put it down, but it's a voluminous record. And within it, there are references to members of the Hemings family, James Hemings. You know, for example, when they are in New York together, 
when Jefferson is Secretary of State before the Capitol moves, you can record James Hemings's daily activities through Jefferson's actions. You know, gave James this amount of money to do this. James went here and got that. All these kinds of things in ways that are pretty amazing to think to have a sort of day-to-day record of people's activities. But at the same time, when you're looking at his letters and the letters of white people who were talking about these people, I had to keep in mind their relationship, who these people were. And you can't take for granted their characterizations of enslaved people, for example. You have to remember that these are people who occupy this degree of power of these individuals that's extreme and make adjustments for that. So I started with Jefferson's records. Some members of the Hemings family were literate, so we have some of their letters. And oral history, the family history of Jefferson and the family history of the Hemingses as well. I looked at that, and when you use that kind of material, you look for corroborating evidence to support what is being said. And I think you should do that as well, even for documentary evidence. Just because something is written down doesn't mean it's true. But all of it requires seeing statements made gathering information, and then trying to look for as much corroboration, support as you can from other documents until you are sure that what you're saying is likely correct. And it's the process that, you know, it's, you don't go through. It depends on how important the statement is. You know, if there's some things that are uncontroversial, but if there are things that are likely to be controversial, you look for as much support as you can for it. And that's what I did for both of them. I mean, I don't accept Just because Jefferson says something is true, writes that it's true, I didn't accept that it was necessarily true. I tried to find corroboration for it. And when Madison Hemings gives his recollections and says that, you know, Jefferson was his father, I didn't just accept that. I looked for other information that corroborates what they're saying. So you're building a case. I mean, you're trying to provide evidence for what it is that you're saying. So that was the main process, is the process of finding information about these people, and then looking for anything that I could outside of the four corners of those documents to support what they were saying. Did you ever find yourself needing to speculate when you couldn't necessarily corroborate something as much as you wanted to, or when you couldn't find a direct statement to interrogate? Yes. And as I was saying before, as long as you tell the reader that that's what you're doing, I think it's okay. There's a moment in the Hemingses where Sally Hemings is boarded out of the Hotel de Langea. She spends four weeks away, maybe a little bit more than four weeks away from the Hotel de Langea, boarding with Dupre is the name. And we think this was the Jefferson family launder, the person who did their clothes. And we're trying to figure out what she's doing there. There's no indication why she's there. But I found that at some point, Jefferson's daughter, Polly, comes down with typhus which is very, very contagious. This happens about the same time that Sally Hemings is boarded out. Now, I don't know that she was boarded out to sort of keep her away as a sort of a quarantine kind of thing. But I offer in the Hemings is that this might be it because the timing works so perfectly. But there's no letter from Jefferson saying, you know, we're going to send her away. We're boarding her out, you know, as a measure of quarantine. You know, Patsy is still at school. But we're boarding her out for that. But it happens at the same time. So that's the speculation. I don't say that it's definitely that. But in looking at the material, it comes so close together that it's the kind of thing that as a reader, I would want to know. I mean, that was my standard for it. If this was something that as a reader, if I were to come on it on my own, I would say, I wonder why this person didn't mention this. Why didn't the author mention this connection? And so with that, I do speculate about it. I think. That's much better than leaving it out, and it's much better than writing it in an authoritative way as if you know the answer, which happened a lot of times in Jefferson biographies, where other biographies, people will say flatly a declarative statement, this is what happens, and the reader is asked to believe that. And one of the things that I did in my first book was going through and unpacking a lot of those declarative statements that were made rather than put forth in a form of speculation. I would rather have a writer say, you know, I don't know for sure, but blah, versus just saying it. Or alternatively, leaving something that is potentially connective totally out. A lot of these things I put in endnotes. That's what endnotes can be for, to say, you do know that blah, 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 and put those things together there. But 
if it's something that piques my interest, then I think it should pique the reader's interest as well, is the point. If it raises my eyebrows, then I think I should report on that as well. And I, you've clearly thought deeply about biography as both a writer and a reader. And I wonder if you have any advice for us on how we should read a biography to get the most out of it. How to read a biography to get the most out of it. Well, I think you should read with a degree of skepticism. Try to find out the author's point of view, how the author handles good and bad news about, about the subject. You know, I've been critical of Duma Malone's biography of Jefferson, even though it's a masterful work and everybody who writes about Jefferson has to use the work. In the earlier volumes, I noticed a tendency to sort of explain away Jefferson's behavior. When a biographer is always explaining the person's behavior and it's always somebody else's fault if something is going wrong, then you can kind of get a sense that the person is too much in love with the subject matter, has too much of a stake in the subject, the person about whom they're writing. I noticed, though, that over the years, Malone's tone changed a bit as he got to know the subject better. There was much less of that. By the time he writes The Sage of Monticello, he's still in some ways apologetic for Jefferson, but he understood much more so near the end than the beginning that he was writing about a complicated person. So the tone changes. So what you're looking for is trying to get what message the biographer is trying to send about this person. And you can see that in the way they handle particularly bad things that the person does. Can they be forthright about it? Are they explaining? Are they justifying? And I think the biographer, in some ways, is really writing their own stories, as other people have said. We're bringing a lot of ourselves to this, and we're revealing ourselves and the things that we write, and we choose to write about a subject. So I think getting to know the biographer and paying attention to the biographer's perspective is really important. Friend Potts then went home, and on entering his parlor called out to his wife, Sarah, my dear Sarah, all's well. George Washington will yet prevail. What's the matter, Isaac? replied she. He seems moved. Well, if I seem moved, tis no more than what I really am. I have this day seen what I never expected. He knows that I have always thought that the sword and the gospel were utterly inconsistent, and that no man could be a soldier and a Christian at the same time. But George Washington has this day convinced me of my mistake. He then related what he had seen, and concluded with this prophetical remark, If George Washington be not a man of God, I am greatly deceived, and still more shall I be deceived, if God do not, through him, work out a great salvation for America. The history of the United States is most effectively told through the lives of people. As Annette reminded us, the United States is not a country with a long history. So to get at the story of the United States and who Americans were and are, we need to look at its people and how those people have made progress and treated each other over time. To get at a full picture of the history of the United States, we need to consider its diversity and look at the lives of all sorts of different people, including those like Thomas Jefferson, powerful men who left behind voluminous accounts of writing about their lives, and people like members of the Hemings family enslaved and free African-American men and women who left behind far fewer records about their lives. Getting at the life stories of people who left behind few written records can pose a real challenge for biographers. Annette revealed that to get at the lives of the Hemingses, she had to start with Thomas Jefferson's papers and the few documents and letters literate members of the Hemings family left behind. Then she had to look for documentation and oral histories that could corroborate all the information she found in those documents. At other times, Annette had to interpret actions and infer something about the person and the situation they were involved in by investigating all the context around them. For example, she noted that the matriarch of the Hemings family, Elizabeth Hemings, left no written records about her life. So Annette looked to situate Elizabeth in the time and place she lived in by looking at the records of other African and African-American women in Williamsburg, Virginia. Annette found that she couldn't talk about Elizabeth specifically 
but she could help her readers better understand the time and place Elizabeth lived in. Still, at other times, Annette had to speculate. For example, Annette speculated about why Thomas Jefferson may have boarded Sally Hemings out of his house while they were living in Paris. Annette didn't have a direct statement from Jefferson or anyone else about why he did this. But she did have information that Polly Jefferson had typhus and a receipt with a date that reflects that Sally was boarded out during Polly's illness. This led Annette to speculate that Jefferson likely boarded out Sally as a measure of quarantine. Now, as Annette related, biographers and historians will speculate when they don't have direct information, but they do have enough indirect information to make an informed guess as to what happened or why someone acted a certain way. And this is okay as long as they tell their readers what they're speculating about and why they're speculating. So how do biographers approach their sources, whether they be voluminous or scant? Carefully. Biographers need to bring curiosity, empathy, healthy skepticism, and a level of detachment to their work. And this work includes finding, interrogating, corroborating, and interpreting all the different historical sources they find. They need to keep in mind who wrote the sources they're using. What motives the author had for writing a source? Who or what the author included in a source? And who or what they left out of a source? As all three of our guests, Scott, Flora, and Annette revealed, good biographies rely on telling the lives of people using the practiced historical methods of thorough archival research and the sound interrogation of historical sources. They've also reminded us about people. Although the purpose and goals of biography have and do change over time and place, At its core, the genre of biography is always about people. Of these private deeds of Washington, very little has been said. In most of the elegant orations pronounced to his praise, you see nothing of Washington below the clouds, nothing of Washington the schoolboy, the diligent surveyor, the neat draftsman, the laborious farmer, the widow's husband, the orphan's father the poor man's friend. No, that is not the Washington you see. Tis only Washington the hero and the demigod, Washington the sunbeam in council or the storm in war. Since then, it is the private virtues that lay the foundation of all human excellence. Since it was these that exalted Washington to be Columbia's first and greatest son, be it our first care to present these in all their luster before the admiring eyes of our children. For who among us can hope that his son shall ever be called like Washington to direct the storm of war, or to ravish the ears of deeply listening senates? To be constantly placing him then before our children in this high character, what is it but like springing in the clouds a golden phoenix, which no mortal caliber can ever hope to reach, or like setting pictures of the mammoth before the mice, whom not all the manna of heaven can ever raise to equality. Oh no, give us his private virtues. In these, every youth is interested, because in these, every youth may become a Washington, a Washington in piety and patriotism, in industry and honor and consequently, a Washington in what alone deserves the name, self-esteem and universal respect. Finished. If you'd like more information about our guests, Scott Casper, Flora Frazier, and Annette Gordon-Reed, the books they've written, or notes from our conversations with them, check out the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 209. This episode marks the start of the Omohundro Institute's four-episode Doing History series about biography. Over the next three episodes, we'll speak with individual biographers about individual lives. The next two episodes will be about John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Marshall is someone you've been asking to know more about, and both of our guests, Joel Richard Paul and Richard Brookheiser, approach Marshall's life differently in their respective biographies. In our fourth episode, We'll speak with Erica Dunbar about Ona Judge and how Erica approached researching and writing the life of someone who left behind just a few quotes and a couple of newspaper articles about her escape from the household of George and Martha Washington. Now, throughout this episode, you heard selections from Mason Locke Weems's Life of George Washington, the first biography of George Washington. As Scott Casper mentioned, 
Weems wrote a lot of this biography with unsubstantiated anecdotes and designed it to teach young children about how to be good Republican citizens. Still, I wanted you to get a feel for what biography sounded in Red Lake during the early 19th century. The John Marshall Foundation sponsored today's episode. If you're curious about John Marshall, be sure to visit their website, johnmarshallfoundation.org. The John Marshall Foundation has all sorts of free resources for you to explore, including a newly re-released version of Alan B. Magruder's book, American Statesman John Marshall. Again, visit johnmarshallfoundation.org to learn more. As part of this series, the Omohundro Institute's Digital Projects team is working to bring you more about biography. They've commissioned blog posts by historians, editors, and biographers to bring you more and different ideas about the genre. They're also working on electronic resources, too, such as a list of all the biographies our guests recommended as great examples of the genre. Both the blog posts and these e-resources are available through the OI Reader app. The app is free and will be updated with each episode, so visit benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader to download the app, or search for OI Reader in your favorite app store. Finally, why do you enjoy biography? As we consider biography and why we love it so much, I'm curious to know what you think. So please tell me. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.